It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. Are there creatures out there that man has yet to discover? Are there other worlds right here amongst our own that we cannot see? There are many places that we can go in search of these mysteries, but none is scarier than the deepest, darkest caves that tunnel beneath the surface of the earth. There are thousands of caves in the world. In the United States alone, experts have discovered more than 17,000 caves, and thousands more remain hidden and unidentified. Just imagine the horrifying possibilities. Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover the horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. Today we are discussing the first known creepypasta, Ted the Caver. Ted and a couple of his friends explore a cave close to his home, which continuously gets more and more horrifying. This show is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com and be sure to follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can also leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow, and hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook for information on future episodes. The smell of coffee did the trick every time. It was as if the caffeine entered my bloodstream just by inhaling it. I rolled over and stretched and accidentally kicked the side of the tent, bringing me to instant awareness. Stifling a yawn, I sat up and grabbed my backpack, eager to get dressed and get to that coffee. Stepping out of the tent, I was greeted to a beautiful morning. The sun was making long mystic beams as it shone down through the branches and leaves. Finley was sitting by the fire, just as I had expected, sipping on a cup of coffee. I smiled at her. This is why you are my best friend, I said. She gave me that look of faked seriousness and replied, Yeah, you are one lucky girl. Come get a cup of coffee and let's go over our plan for the day. She didn't have to tell me twice. Black coffee was perfect on the trail. It fit the setting. At home, I would be hitting the Starbucks for my regular white chocolate iced latte, but out here, it had to be stronger stuff made for roughing it. Okay, so what is the plan for today, Captain Finn? I asked half-jokingly as I sat down cross-legged across from her, realizing too late that the ground was still soggy from the morning dew. She cleared her throat before answering. Ahem. Well, since we have three days, I thought we would hike on up the trail and get some pictures from the ridge before making camp. Then we can head back down in the morning and set up camp here again before heading home. How does that sound? Sounds good to me, as long as we don't run into Bigfoot or run out of coffee, I joked. Finley was an amateur photographer with aspirations of becoming a professional. She was also an avid hiker, and I was her less enthusiastic hiking buddy when her boyfriend was too busy to accompany her. Once the coffee was gone, we began packing up and cleaning the campsite. Vanessa Childers, I know you aren't planning on leaving this here, I heard her snap. 
When I looked around to see what had gotten her dander up, she was staring at a wrapper from my protein bar that I had had for breakfast laying on the ground. Sorry, Captain Finn. Must have fell out of my pocket. I gave her a stiff fake salute before bending over to pick up the wrapper. Sorry, she said sincerely. A new habit I picked up from Josh. I guess he is turning me into a leaf licker. The last was said with a little giggle. That sounds disgusting. I hope that isn't literal, because birds and squirrels piss on these leaves. Not to mention God knows what else. I scrunched my nose up to emphasize my disgust. The trail was smooth, even though it elevated quickly shortly after we started. We made it to the top of the ridge in less time than we had calculated, and were rewarded with the perfect view of Peavine Falls. Finn laid her pack on the ground, and was getting her camera ready as I explored the area, stopping long enough to make a travel brochure-worthy announcement. Welcome to Oak Mountain, home to the sprawling Oak Mountain State Park in Pelham, Alabama. This state park offers lots of beautiful natural scenery, including Peavine Falls, as you can see here. Finn, used to my habit of verbally documenting everything, cut her eyes at me. Quit goofing off and help me set up this tripod. I should have brought my old one. This one has given me nothing but trouble. She had never been mechanically inclined, so I helped her set it up. She walked away, much to my annoyance, and began snapping pictures of the falls without once using the stupid thing. We had only been there about 20 minutes when the skies began to darken, and we heard a clap of thunder. It was little warning for the downpour that almost immediately ensued. The storm had snuck up on us, and as soon as Finn had her camera safely tucked away from the rain, we began to search for shelter. Nessie, this way! Finn yelled over the sound of the rain. We tried to stick to the trail, but the rain was coming down so hard that we could barely see in front of us. Before we knew it, the trail had vanished under the mud and leaves washing down from the hillside. We headed towards the ridge where we hoped the large overhanging rocks would create a shelter. Once we got there, we followed along the long wall of rocks looking for a place to duck under when we discovered an opening that looked like a tiny cave. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. With a forever expanding history and fandom, you've undoubtedly heard the phrase creepypasta thrown around. It began on the internet, rumored to have begun in the 1990s by chain emails. It's no wonder that creepypastas are so well known today as they've had 30 years to creep from the darkest depths of the web. Yes, it all started with the invention of the internet, seen only as a luxury before expanding into a common household service. And with little to no moderation, something was bound to happen at some point. The first creepypasta were spam emails, although it's near impossible to find what they contained. Creepypastas are horror-related stories that have been shared around the internet. Creepypasta has become a catch-all term for any horror content posted onto the internet. These internet entries are often brief, user-generated, paranormal stories intended to scare readers. 
They include tales of murder, suicide, and otherworldly occurrences. The subject matter varies widely and can include topics such as ghosts, murder, zombies, original monsters, and haunted television shows and video games. Creepypastas can range in length, from a single paragraph to a lengthy, multi-part series that can span multiple media types. The first true beginning that we are aware of is a story named Ted the Caver. The story follows Ted as he and a small group of friends explore a cave close to his home, which continuously gets more and more horrifying. Ted's story was uploaded online March 23, 2001 and is considered the first ever creepypasta. It tells the tale of Ted and his friend B, as he refers to him, as they both explore the cave and strange things keep happening. It ends on a cliffhanger, where many presume Ted has died. Ted the Caver chronicles his insane journey and makes it available to read on the internet. The story is a popular legend and has been reported on the creepypasta.com page which encourages writers to submit their horror stories, whether true or not. What makes this story believable is that the author has created an informative journal of his experiences, complete with pictures. His diary is long, but records every step of the journey with photos and descriptions. Ted warns not to ask the location of the cave because he will not give it. His diary is lengthy and descriptive, but it's his attention to detail that might make the most skeptical reader wonder. As Ted says at the beginning of the diary, if you think these events sound far-fetched, I agree. If I hadn't experienced them, I'd come to the same conclusion. If you choose to read Ted's diary, it might take you some time. It is rather long. Here is a summary of what you will read. On February 2001, Ted and B, avid explorers, descended into a cave with the hopes of exploring it one last time. Ted had been fascinated by a hole deep within its passages and wondered if there was a way to get through it. The size of the opening was only wrist thick, but they were determined to break through it and discover the mysteries that lie beneath. As they sat beside the opening trying to decide what tools they would need, they heard strange noises coming from within, wind and rumbling that Ted assumes was the natural effects of ambient noises and the passing of traffic nearby. Once they decided what they would need to continue the excavation, they left, eager to return to begin the work. It was almost a month later when they returned, armed with cordless drill and sledgehammers. The two men returned to the mystery cave and began the arduous task of making an accommodating crawl space into the rock. Their work continued for months with strange occurrences happening every step of the way. At one point, Ted explains B was sitting near the opening and claims to have heard something strange. He said that he swore he just heard a strange noise coming from the hull. He said it sounded like rock sliding on rock, sort of a grinding sound. In the weeks to come, the men had dug further into the opening, hoping to make it wide enough for them to pass. But as they did, some more strange noises kept breaking through the darkness. Ted says there was one instance in which a loud scream could be heard even over the sound of his DeWalt drill. It was loud. I could hear it over the noise of the drill, even though I had the earplugs in. At first, I thought it was just the drill bit doing its job on the cave. It would frequently complain by screeching and whining as we forced it into the wall. But this was different. It took me several full seconds to comprehend that it was coming from the inside the hole, and not the bit. I stopped drilling and yanked my earplugs out just in time to hear the most terrible scream I have ever heard, trail off and echo into the darkness of the cavern. Eventually, through weeks of hard work, the men were able to create a hole big enough for Ted to squeeze through. Although his constant contortions through rough rock was exhausting, Ted was finally able to squeeze through the hole and enter a narrow passage that led into the abyss they called the Mystery Cave. Ted explored the rocky channels and openings of this newfound tunnel. He had thought to be a virgin cave, even able to stand in some places, but eventually he discovered he hadn't been the first there. On the left side of the room on the wall at about eye level, I discovered what appeared to be hieroglyphics. It was a single drawing that almost appeared to be just part of the rock coloration. It looked like a very crude representation of people, 
standing below a symbol. I was pumped. This meant there had to be another entrance to this cave. Ted made a crude drawing of the symbol he found on the cave wall, and it had a Blair Witch feel to it. After this discovery, Ted exited the cave assured that he had enough photographic evidence to show B, who had been waiting patiently at the entrance for his friend to resurface. Most pictures came through except for the ones that detailed the room he had found. Wanting to share his discovery, Ted searched for a person that would be able to confirm his and B's findings by climbing through the passage himself. That person was Joe. Once there, Joe managed to climb through the opening and disappear into the darkness of the cavern. But he quickly emerged and remained silent about his experiences in the tunnels. Ted explains Joe's odd behavior. Once we got outside the cave, Ted writes, I figured we'd be able to find out more from Joe. But when he got to the final climb, he just unclipped from the rope and went straight to the truck. In the light of the day, he looked even worse than in the cave. B and I gathered up the rope and our gear and headed for the truck. Joe said he did not want to stay overnight because he felt terrible, and I believed him. So we headed home. We could get no more information from Joe. He just stared straight ahead. He was shaking like a leaf, even though he said he was not cold. When we tried to question him, his answers were short. I asked him if he saw the hieroglyphics. No. Did he hear us yelling? No. Did he see the round rock? No. Did he see the crystals? No. He said he just went a little way in and started to feel sick. Something was fishy about his answers. He would have had to have seen the crystals if he got far enough into the cave that he couldn't hear us yelling. But why would he not elaborate? It was two weeks later before Ted would return to the cave and have his own terrifying experience during the journey through it. In his diary, he explains that as he made his way through the tight corridors of the tunnels, he heard scraping noises. Ted describes the sound. It was loud. It was close. It was coming from the large room I had just left. I wheeled around to face whatever had made the noise. When I did, I lost my presence of mind and stood up at the same time. Crunch. My helmet crashes into the passage ceiling. My light broke, and I was buried in the heavy darkness. Through this entire ordeal, Ted explains that a putrid smell began to fill the halls of the cave. It smelled like damp, rotting, rancid, putrid death. Ted began to use green glow sticks to light his way through the tunnels and discovered large boulders had been moved from their original positions, revealing other channels deep within the passage. Through time and effort, Ted finally began to make his way back to the entrance, but not without hearing noises following behind him and something trying to pull his ropes back into the darkness. Ted urged B to hurry and exit the cave ahead of him. B had also begun to feel uneasy, shaken, and in pain. Ted emerged from the ground shortly after B, and B frantically cut the ropes from Ted's body. They traveled home in silence, and Ted would soon have nightmares. These dreams would compel him to return to the cave, saying in his diary that closure was what he needed. In Ted's story, he mentions looking up caving myths and finding out about the creature called a hodag. So naturally, many think the hodag is responsible for the strange happenings and maybe what was pulling on the rope. The hodag is a folkloric animal referred to as a fearsome creature. Its history is focused mainly on the city of Rhinelander in northern Wisconsin, where it is said to have been discovered. The black hodag had the head of a bull, the grinning face of a giant man, thick short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with a spear at the end. It lived in the dense regions of nearby swamps, feasting mostly on mud turtles, water snakes, and muskrats although it did partake in an occasional human. Most any caver has heard of the legend of the Hodag, even though this myth has proven to have been debunked way back in 1896. The last entry into Ted's journal on May 19, 2001 ends with him saying, See all of you soon with lots of answers. Love, Ted. The website states that it was last updated on that day. Could this be a hoax or an urban legend? or a simple case of creative writing. But why would someone go through so much trouble to take pictures and document the experience so vividly? Thanks to online sleuths, there may finally be some answers, 
but there is no way to prove whether these answers they found are true or not. John, author of John's blog, said he came across the story and that the cliffhanger ending left him feeling frustrated and needing to seek closure. In his search for closure, he came across a story by Thomas Lara. The story claimed that the Ted the Caver story was plagiarized from a short story written by Lara. He then searched until he found Lara's short story, which is titled The Fear of Darkness. While reading The Fear of Darkness, he noticed that Lara's story was slightly different. In this story, a general location is given, and many of the subtle details are dropped. John says his initial impression of the story is that he did not like it. He said the ending was far-fetched, totally unbelievable and unrealistic. He also disliked that it used the age-old cliché of the old Indian burial ground. Egged on by his doubts and curiosity, John finds that the Ted the Caver is the original story and that Thomas Lara had used the fear of darkness as a literary attempt to add an ending to the original story. John continued digging and eventually found the location of the cave in Utah. It is called Interstate Cave and is part of the Timpanogos Cave Network. The Timpanogos Cave Network is in the Wasatch Mountains in American Fork Canyon near American Fork, Utah. Still, John could not rest until he discovered the author of Ted the Caver. Finally, he found answers posted on the National Speleological Society Discussion Board, dated November 25, 2004, by Ralph Powers. Powers had written, The story is true. I happen to know B and his dog. And I've been in the cave and through the hole after they opened it up. The passage goes directly under the interstate, both directions and all four lanes. I suspect that what those weird, odd sounds they heard were semis moaning over, and probably at one time a tire screeching to a halt or something similar, filtered through the bedrock, and the sound can be distorted enough to have that otherworldly effect. In the same thread, John also discovered a post from Ted. Yes, the man claiming to be Ted the Caver. This is what he had to say. Well, I guess it's time I add my two cents to the topic. My name is Ted, and I am the author of the story you have been discussing. I am the original author. I created the story on my own and copied no one. I will explain the details of the creation of the story in a moment. But first, let me just say, wow. I am still thrilled and amazed by all the discussion that my story has generated. I was aware of how many people had visited my website, the Angel Fire site, because of the counter on the site, and that number had slowly been climbing since I started the site. But I had no idea that two other people had copied the site, with one going so far as adding an alternate ending, complete with a doctored photo. And I had no idea that the story had been discussed on numerous forums. I want to thank everyone who took the time to read the story. I hope you enjoyed it. It took a long time to write, and even though there are a few things I would change, I am happy with how it turned out. Between December 30, 1999 and February 24, 2000, Brad and I worked on a passage in Freeway Cave. We made numerous trips and spent many hours of hard work before we were finally able to get through the opening and into the new section of cave. During our adventure, I kept a caving journal and documented our activities surrounding our attempts to be the first people to enter the new passage. Since we were giving friends and family members updates as we worked, I thought it would be a good idea to put my entire journal on a web page along with our pictures. Then we could simply refer people to the site. The thought then occurred to me. It sure would be fun to embellish the story a little. From there, it was just a short leap to simply creating a work of fiction based on our experiences. I felt like the internet was a perfect medium for my idea, so that is what I set out to do. So there we have it. The mystery is solved. Or is it? As far as I can tell, no one has verified any of this, to even know that the Ted claiming to be the original is even real. And if the story is true and not embellished, then what is lurking beneath the surface in the deep, dark, unexplored caves of this world? Once inside the cave, Finn and I turned to watch rain forming its own waterfall over the entrance. Soaked to the bone, I began to shiver. <sighs> Can we build a fire? I asked Finn through chattering teeth. Let's look around and see if we have anything to make a fire with, Finn ordered, 
always the one to take the lead. She dug a small flashlight out of her pack and used its beam to look around. Wow, I had no idea there were caves up here. I realize this is all exciting to you, but I am freezing and this cave is creepy. Can we try to get a fire going before something comes crawling out of the dark to eat us? I said, realizing I sounded quite pathetic. Okay, look around and grab anything that will burn, she ordered. There were plenty of branches and dried leaves laying around, so we quickly had a pile big enough to start a small fire. I would have changed clothes, but the rain had drenched my cheap backpack and everything inside was soaked. So instead, we huddled together close to the fire and warmed up while waiting for the rain to stop. Another loud clap of thunder seemed to cause the unthinkable to happen. Mud, rocks, and tree limbs began to pour down at the entrance of the cave, and within seconds, we were staring at a wall where our exit had been. Oh my God, what are we going to do? I said, near panic. Calm down. It's going to be okay, Finn reassured me. It's time to call for help. She took her cell phone out of her pocket and dialed Josh's number. He answered immediately. Thank God, Finn said. Josh, we are stuck in a cave somewhere up near Peavine Falls. She waited for a response, but all she heard was static and brief clips of Josh's voice. She hung up and tried again, with even less results, until finally her calls wouldn't go through at all. I tried my phone next, and the same thing happened. Finn put her phone away. Hopefully he heard enough, but if he didn't, surely there's enough signal they can locate us. I could tell she was grasping and I wondered just how long it would take before we knew if she was right or not. Luckily, we still had our fire, at least until the branches and leaves ran out. After that, I didn't know what we would do. The stress had exhausted me, so using my backpack as a pillow, I laid down to rest and to calm myself. Finn sat across from me, watching the fire, and every few minutes, testing her phone. You might want to save what charge you have left until we can use it, I warned her gently. You're right, she said reluctantly. I am sorry for getting you into this, Nessie. I would rather be here with you than outside looking for you. I reassured her before I dozed off. Scratching sounds woke me, and I looked around expecting to find Finn making the noise, but she wasn't there. I looked towards the cave entrance. It was still blocked. I looked around and found that Finn's backpack was gone too. I jumped to my feet and listened. The scratching sounds were coming from deeper in the cave. Finn! I yelled, but was only answered with the echo of my own voice. Damn it! I said to myself. I knew I was going to have to look for her. Be brave, Vanessa. You can do this. I kept telling myself over and over as I pulled my backpack over my shoulders and stared off into the dark cave. All I had for light was a keychain flashlight my brother had given me. Luckily, it was surprisingly powerful to be so small. I was worried about the scratching sounds, but more worried that it may be Finn hurt somewhere making those sounds. I counted my steps an OCD habit from grade school. I was almost 100 when the scratching stopped and a breeze howled through the cave, sending a chill up my spine. Finn! I yelled again, but still no answer. So I continued, but something dark flitted out in front of me. It looked like a shadow, but it looked somehow alive. My heart began to pick up beat. Finn, is that you? This isn't funny. I was listening for a response when I heard a low, threatening growl coming from somewhere behind me. Then it was joined by another somewhere ahead of me. My mind was racing. With possible threats from each direction, I didn't know what to do. If I turned back, there was no way out. If I kept going, I might find Finn and a way out. Either way, I may have to fight for my life. So I kept going, 
The whole time it felt like something was circling me, slowly surrounding me, just waiting for the chance to pounce. My light began to flicker, and as I tapped it on my hand, I tripped over something and fell to the ground, scuffing my hands and knees. Luckily, the chain on the flashlight was wrapped around my wrist and the flickering had stopped. I tightened the tip to make sure it wouldn't flicker anymore and then began to search the area around me. I immediately saw what I had tripped over. It was Finn. She was sitting spread-eagled, leaning against the cave wall, unconscious. Oh my God, Finn! I began to gently pat her on the cheeks, trying to get her to wake up. The growling began to grow closer, and I began to panic and slap her harder. Ouch! She finally moaned. Stop hitting me! Finn, come on, we gotta go. Something is in here with us. This got her attention. I thought I heard it too. I was trying to come back, but I bumped my head. Come on, Finn. You can explain later. I was giving the orders this time. Once she was on her feet, we hurried through the cave. But as we progressed, the cave began to grow narrow and close in on us. It became so narrow that we were crawling when we finally saw light up ahead. Thank God. I said as I led the way, there's a way out. It opened close to the waterfall. I could hear it in the distance. I turned to help Finn the rest of the way out when she began to scream, and something pulled her roughly back into the cave. I tightened my grip on her hands and suddenly became caught in a tug of war with whatever was pulling on her from inside the cave. She was screaming and I was pulling with all my strength and weight when finally... She broke free. We tumbled together several feet down the hill before coming to a stop. We found our way back to the waterfall, even though Finn was limping from whatever had pulled so hard on her ankles, spraining one of them. Both covered in bruises, we eventually made it to the trail where search and rescue found us. Needless to say, mine and Finn's hiking days are over. At least for now, anyways. Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts such as Unexplained Encounters and Tales from the Break Room. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook for information on future episodes. Tune in next week as we discuss Shadow People. Are they a figment of our imagination or something sinister stalking us? Until next time, stay safe out there because this world is a strange one.